Hey everybody, I'm Jordan with PDQ, and I'm here with a demo for PDQ Connect, which if you like deploying things and you like doing it over an agent, boy, have I got great news for you. So PDQ Connect combines a lot of the uh, functionality of inventory and deploy, but it makes it so if you're not centrally located, you can still get the same value and uh, keep, keep on running along with uh, everything's great. First part, if you are gonna be using an agent is you have to have an agent, you have to get it installed. There's a link on the bottom when you logged in here, it says download agent installer. Download that, it's going to create an agent specific for your instance, and it is an MSI. So you know the silent parameters are forward slash QN. Then after that, it's basically do install it. If they're local at the time, you can just push it out any other way you do. I recommend PDQ deploy. If they're remote, you can just send them the MSI. It's a small file. They just have to double click on it. They would have to hit next because if they're not running with silent, it's not going to work that way. But once it's installed, it checks in and runs great. After that, once we have these machines checking in, we have our devices tab. This is where the core of the information is, as well as some pre-built collections. We're looking at here. Uh, there's a deployments tab. This is actions that have been done recently within your environment. And whether it was successful, you can kind of do some troubleshooting if you got an error. Uh, packages. These are all of the pre-built packages that we have in PDQ Deploy, as well as if you built any custom packages that'd be stored in here is where you can kind of find them. Automation is where you, I mean, self-explanatory, it's where automation goes. If you're looking to keep things up to date, that's where it goes. And the last one we have is reports, and this is where you can build some custom reports and get those sent out and make sure everyone has information readily available and uh, good to go. So I guess the best way to do a demo is just showcase value. We'll do some installs. Uh, we'll do Notepad++ for this one. So if you're looking at the pre-built collections you have that come with it, we've got 7-zip, and then under there you have old, not installed, and latest. Uh, each one of those has a custom filter you can kind of dive into where you have the software name starts with and the version is greater than, and that's how you know it has the latest version, greater than or equal to. So if we're looking to build our own custom one, we're just going to build one for Notepad++. I'm going to go up to the top here, click on filters, and we say we said software, name, we'll do contains, but we can do starts with as well, whichever one works best for you. And Notepad++ is in our library, which means the variables for that one already exist. So you don't have to manually put that in there. We're just gonna come in here and we're gonna grab the name, Notepad++, save as group, and I'm gonna give it a real unique name here that no one's expecting of Notepad++. Apparently that one already exists, so apparently I did this in my demo. We'll do Notepad++. Plus, plus minus. There we are. Make sure I put it somewhere where it needs to go. That's why we got the search. All right, so we come into Notepad++, we see we have nine machines. That is not accurate. Well, it is accurate because they're all old, but this is just machines that have Notepad++ installed right now. If we want to worry about the version, we're going to come in here and click on filters again, and we're going to add a filter, where once again, it's going to be software. And this time it's going to be version, and we're going to do is less than, and then pre-built variables. We don't have to go and type in or find out what the current one is. We're going to go and find notepad and do app version notepad. And we're going to update that group. In this case, they're all, out, they're all old. So we have nine, nine of them are old, but now we're checking a different thing. Now, now that we know which ones we need to have updated, it's as simple as if you're doing a one-time thing, come up here, you hit deploy. We selected the group we built of notepad plus minus, and then we're going to come in here and choose the package of notepad plus plus. Uh, no, we won't do 64. I'm not feeling it. And this would be a one-time deployment. This would get everything in that, in that current OU or group up to date. Uh, instead, we're going to cancel that because the next part we're going to go into is automation. So instead of going into and doing it all manually, we're going to want to go and set that up so it is done uh, automatically. So we're going to name this one Notepad plus minus again. All right, so the package. It's going to be no different there. We're going to go find it, notepad. We have it in there, and you can see right here, it says the latest version. This is because this is a package that we keep up to date. The new version comes out. We test it. We make sure it's good. We update it. Everything, including the variables, updates without you touching it. Latest will make sure every time the schedule kicks off, if a new version comes out, it'll update. Hands off. You don't need to think about it. If you're looking for a specific version, you would specify that here. 
but uh, I think that's going to be a, a one-off case. Usually you're going to want the latest version. After that, we want this to be recurring instead of a once, and we're going to choose the 20th at uh, 9. Uh, we'll do PM. And we're going to repeat that once every week on a Friday. So every Friday, 9 PM, it's going to go check, is there a new version of Notepad++? If so, update all those machines that already have it. You're good to go. You're done. You don't have to think about it. And we want to set this to deploy to Notepad plus minus. And there we go. And that is our automation for that. That will run. Oh, I mean, I said for Friday, so I'll run this Friday. We'll be up to date. Uh, the next part after automation is going to be packaging. And this is where we have all the default ones, but sometimes you have software that we don't have in the library. Either there's a EULA, we can't build it, or it's custom software. We still need to get that installed. And that's where you do that here. So we're going to do here. We're going to keep with the notepad plus minus theme uh, version 32.976. I've hit five. There we go. Description. Now the timeout here defaults to five minutes. With something like notepad, you're probably fine. But if it's something where you know it takes some time, that's where you're going to want to put that customization to make sure it doesn't time out while it's installing. We're going to go 30 minutes. After that, it comes down to the diff different steps. And these are all the steps we have. The first one is the install step. Any install file, exe, MSI, if you have uh, something that will transform a registry key, that would go in there. Uh, if it is an MSI, good news, we know those silent parameters. We're going to throw those in there for you. But if it is an exe, that's where it requires some research. Either you got to go into the command line with the forward slash question mark, see if you can't find the silent parameter there, research online, wherever that exe is, that can be whatever. So with the, we're going to say with this one, it's shush your face is how we get silent there. Uh, the next line down here, this is the success codes. The default is zero. That means it was good. There are different installs or different things you can do where you get a different success code that if we don't have the number in there, it's not going to work for you because it can report back uh, something weird. I have an example of that for a later step that we'll cover in just a bit. Uh, next is what do you want to run this as? Local system is going to install for everybody. If this is something that installs on a per user basis, changing that from local system to logged on user is going to install it for that user. Make it, uh, makes it so you can control a lot more local packages, things like if they have the, the Chrome single install, which hopefully you're using enterprise, uh, your Apex packages, uh, things of that nature, all that software, that's going to be a, a logged on user instead. And the last one is error mode. The default's the most common, finds an error stops. That makes sense. Uh, the next one is finds an error continues. That's if there's lots of different things. Say, I want to go find this file. If it finds the file, great. If not, it doesn't really matter. You can continue. There's a lot of variations in there. But basically, that one says, if there comes with an error, continue on with the install anyway. You'll know when you need that one. It's, that's more of a, you're looking for a specific setting that you don't have a flag for or a registry key. So some sort of setting that you know needs to be there is not there. That's where that will come in. And the last one is, uh stop on success and that one's different and that one's just the exact opposite if it comes back successful uh then make sure it doesn't go to the next step that's where if i have like a multi-step process go through the first one if the first one is great it doesn't need to go any farther it's done stop you're done if it fails with an error then you know that there's some sort of cleanup or something the next step kicks off and runs that one a little bit of variation work in between but most common this is going to be if it has an error it stops that, that just makes sense the next one is the script step. Uh, you can use all kinds of scripts. I use PowerShell because PowerShell is the best. You can also use command line if you so choose. I'll judge you from afar. PowerShell is the way to go. But uh, whatever's best for you. Everyone has their own, what they, what they work best in. And this is where actually we're going to showcase the error code I was uh, talking about. So if we do task kill, look at that. I said don't use command line and then task kill is a command line. Not exe. Uh, was it forward slash MN? I'd have to go look that up again. But yeah, we're, we're going to assume I got the right flag, task kill, and we're going to stop uh, steve.exe. All right, so task kill is going to go in there. If it finds a process, it kills it, it's going to return a zero. Killed, it's fine. That's what you want. If it goes out there and it says there is nothing for steve.exe, that is going to return a 128. Now that is a success because we're running task kill because we want it to stop. Task kill has nothing to stop. It means it's not running. 
128 is a success. We're going to add that as an optional there. That way, kill or doesn't exist, it's going to continue on. And it's the same thing here where you can add your parameters, your error modes, nothing change much past that one. Next one, file copy. Uh, shout out to Steve in an earlier video. He talked about how there are certain installs, things like Adobe, that don't always work well running over network. So he uses this to copy those files over, runs the install there and removes them. That's a great use for that one. Other options is if there's additional files, like there's a transform file or an XML document is pulling them from, this is where you can copy that file over and, and be good to go. Uh, next one, reboot. It reboots the machine. You can also shut it down. That's, uh, I don't know where to go with that one. If you want to leave him a message, great. That one's pretty explanatory. It's valuable, it's useful. Can't really build on it. Last one, and I like this one a lot, this is the nested step. If you have a whole bunch of packages you can do install, and this can be for many things, uh, you know, you have a baseline, new computer plugs in, you want to make sure they have X software. You would come in here and you would add each bit of software as a nested step. And it's going to go into the already existing package that is there, add it in there. And so you don't have to rebuild that package. It's just using the same one without having to have multiple versions of it. That one's pretty valuable. I like that one a lot, especially for things like baseline. And that's pretty much everything for these new install steps. The last part we're going to cover is reporting. This is, you have collections, you want to look for some information. This is where you kind of track it down. So the first thing we do is create a report. Uh, real report. For real. All right, and this one's pretty straightforward. If you have logic within a certain group that we set up early in devices, you can come here and you can select that group. We'll do A. I did that one earlier. I believe that one is for machines that are running out of hard drive space. We'll find out if that's accurate when we run this live. And then you're going to select your columns. By default, it pulls up your device table. Uh, so I'm going to go and find device name because we do want the name of the computer. And the next one, we're going to come down to the disk drives table. And we are going to look for, there we go, disk free percentage. Uh, confirm that. That's everything we want there. We're going to save and run that report. Oh, did I not select a column for disk drives? Oh, no, because disk free is not a disk drive. Apparently, that is a device. I'm pulling up tables I don't even need to pull up. Now we're going to save and run that one. This goes quick. It's going to go query all your devices. You can see here, hey, I have the right report. A is devices that have less than 30% disk free. It's going to come up here. It's going to give you a list of machines and where they're at on their disk usage. And you can rerun that often as you saw that run pretty quick. Or the other option, you've got a, a boss that likes a pretty table, pretty graph, export CSV. You get all your information right there. You can just send that report to him. Let him know that uh, everything's fine. I mean... Not for those five machines, they're doing a 30% hard drive. But that's pretty much everything for Connect. Uh, this gives you everything you need to make sure that all of your devices, whether they're local or remote, are up to date and secure and have everything that they need to be, I don't know, their best version of themselves. For PDQ, I'm Jordan. <laughs>